Welcome to the beginning of the My City, My Block, My Section, My Street series brought to you by Wealthy Minds and New King Multimedia Group. Welcome to My Block 121, a podcast dedicated to the vibrant community of my street in Harlem, New York City. Throughout this podcast series, I aim to showcase the extraordinary nature of my childhood friends, even though they may not perceive themselves that way. To me, they are all exceptional individuals who beautifully embody the spirit of my block 121. Join me as I illuminate the stories and shine a light on the unique experiences celebrating the unsung heroes of my neighborhood. My block 121. Let's get it. Today on the My Block One Two One podcast, we kick things off with my special guest, my childhood friend Nuno Damasio. Amongst his impressive accomplishments, Nuno has an extensive writing background, having contributed to publications like Sports Illustrated, Seattle Times, and the Washington Post. He was also a beat writer for the Seattle SuperSonics and the Washington Commanders, previously known as the Washington Redskins. Not to mention he achieved New York Times best-selling author status with his book, Parcel, A Football Life. But enough about his accolades. Let's dive straight into the interview. Yeah, but, you know, um... You were the one who told me about the, the, the Marbury thing, that, that, that I was on the Netflix thing. I didn't even know. How? You were fucking interviewing in the movie. Why they didn't give you no points, no sack? Nah, dude, you told me about it. Yeah, I saw I it. Didn't even know. Yeah. Everybody saw it. Everybody in my house. I was like, oh shoot, look at Nuno. Yeah, <laughs> and then somebody else told me after you, but I, I said, yeah, my friend told me about it. Until then, I didn't even know. Honestly, you were. That was a whole. It was a whole move. It was a whole f- <laughs> episode. <laughs> Yeah, it was a whole Oh, you didn't know? You didn't know that you were included? I literally did not know. I think this is what They I had to happened. send you a check. Well, I, I, this is what happened. Now, I, I think it's technically it was the rights of, of New York One. Uh, so I think that's what happened. Uh, they, they went through New York One. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Damn. It, it was their property. Ooh. Yeah, I know. That's good. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of crazy. I guess now it's different, though, because now when, you know, you make an appearance on a big station, you can you can work that into your agreement, like, hey, I can get to use this or that kind of stuff. But that that was that was what I was just starting out, so no. I was just happy to be on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's crazy. I didn't think <laughs> they could use yeah. it 20 years later, but okay. No, I know. Wow. If they, have the, if they have the rights and I didn't sign any You in perpetuity, I'm assuming. Exactly. Exactly. Jeez. But one time some dude called me about Marbury. He was doing a documentary on Marbury and it wasn't a Netflix one, it was something else. He wanted to he wanted to interview me for it. But I think I think he uh he abandoned it. Maybe he abandoned it because of because of the one that uh, that was produced by Kevin uh, Durant. You know that, right? That the Marbury one. Yeah. Oh wow, that's dope. Yeah. I, yo, I didn't even Kevin know that. Durant was an executive producer. That's crazy. Kevin Durant and um, Forrest Whitaker. They put the Forrest Whitaker. Durant put money behind it, and Forrest Whitaker put it. That's name dope. Behind that's it. dope. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, now, that's yeah. fine. All right, so 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 uh, uh, let me let me just talk to you now. You know, I do. Sound good. You you presented well. You okay. Got the artwork in the background, but see, you you knew what was going on. <laughs> I'm keeping that part. Hey, well, yeah. <laughs> you got the artwork in the background. Yeah, oh, come on, man. This dude. That's all the time, man. Anyway, man. So anyway. I might keep I might keep this whole thing going right here because the real feel of a of a podcast is just us talking, having good having a good time. Yeah, but um you know, tell the audience about you. You know, I know you're St. John's, you tell them. I know everything about you, but you could just tell them from the beginning. What did you do? I mean, your questions are um how did you start? What what um what propels you to be in the sports arena? Why did you even try to be a journalist, book writer, beat writer? Yeah, so, 
Well, well, I mean, it goes way back all the way to St. John's University. I mean, part of the reason I went to St. John's University, if you remember, you know, right. big Mark Jackson fan, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, my the, God. I, I love Me St. too, John's, though. Walter Berry. Right. So it's as crazy as it sounds. I mean, that was a factor when I was applying to school. I was like, man, I'd be cool to go to the school and get to watch them live. So that was a, a factor I went to St. John's. Now, I, I majored in communications. Okay. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like, in, in communications, you could take, it could range from TV to screenwriting to, to film to speech. And so I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I took a journalism class with... Um, a journalism class as an elective. Okay. And so the professor pulled me aside after the class, after he had graded some papers. Okay. And then he said that, Nuno, what, what, what's your major? You're a journalism major, right? And then I told him, I said, no. And he said, okay, well, you know, you have a, a really good writing ability. You should be pursuing journalism. That's your, that, I think that's your future. Wow. And I told him, I said, wow, I said, you know, I said, I wish I would have met you earlier because I only, this is, I only have two semesters left. And it's too late to major in journalism. But he was like, hey, I don't care. <laughs> you, you're, you're a talented writer. I want you to come to, you know, they have the same jobs today. So he said, right, moving forward, he said, tomorrow meet me at the, the uh, student paper. And, you know, I, I'll, you know, he's the editor-in-chief, so he's like, I'll, I'll introduce you to my editor. I want you to write some story to me. So that's, he was the one who really actually, Gave you, you know, drove, drove you to write. Right. He altered my life because wow. I, once he did that, and I had somebody who was a journalism professor, he was an editor himself. And I think the New York Times, and so part time. So once he put that in my head, I started doing articles. I remember to, to this day, one of my first articles was on Malik Seaton. I interviewed him in Alumni Hall, and then you know that's where. It's and and you discussed me in that joint as well. Now let's 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 talk about your um. All right, so you went to he he, he redirected your life. And then from right. where? Oh yeah. Yeah, from there. Yeah, so yeah, he, he redirected. He he gave me you know confidence and focus. So then I started pursuing journalism. You know, I graduated from St. John's, and then I was working like a nine to five. The first, the first, um, you know, when you graduate from journalism school, a lot of the jobs you try to get into, they they don't pay anything. Like I had. You know, he, he, I have uh, opportunities to go to like small, you know, little towns, you know, and I'm like, nah, man. It was like small towns for like twenty five thousand a year, you know. Oh wow! You, you, you with like you know like five percent black folks in it. I'm like, nah. Man. <laughs> so I, I did a nine to five, but I kept looking, and I found a job at Newsday covering high school sports, picking up the phone. High school coaches would call in, and then every once in a while, you know, I would um, go to um, a game, you know, um, and uh, a high school game. And so I got, I got this solid experience. It was part time; it was just a high school season. Right, right. No insurance, but I was getting good um, experience. And then I just got, I just got lucky. I went to a journalism convention just to make connections and um, I was supposed to interview with um, a paper of Virginia and then I sat next to just randomly sat next to this woman who and we just started talking and she you know just a, just a very organic discussion and she's like oh how you doing what are you here for and I just you know I told her my situation and then she told me she works for the New York Times uh. and then she wants me to send her some clips and I was like what you know I was in shock because it's the New York Times journalism right. that is the 
paper. Yeah. So I didn't even have that many clips. I had like 10 clips. But long story short, I sent the clips to her and she got me a job picking up phones in the New York Times as a news clerk. Okay. And the editor said to me, well, I, you know, all I'm doing is picking up the phone, answering calls, helping, helping the writers research. But I'm in heaven because I've been reading those writers for years. Right. And then my editor said, hey, then, you, know, you know what? I heard that you, you covered high school sports. Why don't you, you know, we don't do a whole lot of high school sports. Why don't you come up with a story for me and we'll, we'll, we'll put your story in our section. And I, I said to myself, I'm like, nah, he, you know, come on. I, 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 I thought he was just saying that just to say that. So I just was, yeah, because it's like, I'm like, I, I can't, I'm not a writer. You know, I just, I didn't think he was serious. But it was sports, though. This is yeah, your field. Sports, but I was a clerk. Yeah, that's not, you Yeah, know. exactly. Well, I didn't, I didn't really respond to him. Part of it, I was probably a little scared. Um... Then he came back again. He said, Nuno, you know, a week later, he said, do you, do you have any ideas for me? Wow. And then I was like, wow, this guy's for real. So that was when Marbury was lighting it up. Yep. Marbury was the number one high school player in the country. Right. So I told the editor, hey, there's this kid named Stefan Marbury out in Brooklyn. And he would be a great story to... Too. He's, he's on the, the amateur, the, the U.S. Olympic team, even though he's a high school kid. And uh, so he sent me out to Coney Island with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a photographer. And I got lost, but... <laughs> How'd you get lost? I, dude, I'm not... I, I was in Brooklyn, <laughs> Southside. I don't know Brooklyn. I'm like, I'm like you from like, Harlem. <laughs> Where is he? Where is he from? Coney Island. He's from Coney Island. Yeah, he's from Coney Island. Coney Island is not small. Yeah, his his brother Juju was a was a beast too, though. Oh, was he? Yeah. Brother. Well, actually, that was part of the story. All his brothers were beasts. Yeah, nah, Juju was a monster. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 all I did, all I had to say was I'm a reporter trying to do a story on Stefan. Once I said that to some little kids. They were like, oh, I'll take you to his house. <laughs> took me to his apartment. Oh. I, met, I met Stefan. You know, I met his dad. You know, and then we went out to the park, took some pictures. Anthony, I have never, to this day, the few stories that I've worked as hard as is that story. I basically stayed at the New York Times newsroom and didn't go to sleep. It's not even exaggeration. I wrote the entire night, midnight, 1 a.m., 5 a.m., 7 a.m., all I was doing was write. I did not sleep. You and wrote everything? What did you write? Like, everything he said? Everything? Yeah, no, I, I got the story together. You know, you get all the interviews. I've done my research, but I'm saying okay. I'm actually writing the story. I was like a maniac, you mm -hmm. know, and I... And the editor came in early, but he's like, you got the story ready for me? And I said, yeah, I, I have it ready. And I didn't tell him I, I, I stayed overnight just writing the story because I was I was on a mission. Right. And he, he loved the story, put it on the uh, cover of the New York the, the section. And then New York One called me the day that it came out because Back then at the New York Times, you don't get bylines for stories if you're a clerk. Wow. You don't get bylines. So there was no byline, and the New York one guy called me up, and he said, Sam Roberts, I think he still has a show on New York one, and then he said, hey, you know, we're looking for who did the story on Stefan Marbury. That was a great story. We have Stefan on our show. Oh. We want to... We wanna, invite the writer so could you give me the writer's name and i was like that was me that was me <laughs> <laughs> I said, I wrote it. I wrote it. oh That's exactly what i said no joke oh I was like, oh okay you, you you wrote it and you're the clerk 
Mark, I said, yeah. He said, okay, awesome. We'd love to have you on. And then boom, and that's the clip. Is, 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 that, is that the clip from the movie? Exactly. From, wow. That's crazy. And did, that's crazy. That is crazy. And you didn't even know you were in it until I told you. <laughs> that was crazy. I mean, that, so... So that interview looked real professional, though. Because the show is professional. They have, he has big time journalists on that show. Okay. You know, he's a well known, uh, he's a well known uh, reporter for the New York Times. I mean, he's done, a, he's fake, he's done a lot of big stories. He did a, he's the one who wrote when Nikki Barnes died. No one knew, but he found out because he had connections and wow. he interviewed. Barnes, so he, he's a he's a big name at the at the uh, at the Times, and um, yeah, and so that was the story, and, and actually that was a story that helped me go to the Daily News, because we were in competition. The Daily News was known for doing; they had their pulse on high school sports. Yeah, so even they came from the New York Daily News. Yeah, Daily News. That's that's what I played right. in. Yeah, he was mm -hmm. he was because they had a big high school section. So Stephen A. was at the Daily News. Before right before I got there, uh, the year before I got there. But the Daily News editors saw that story and they wished they had gotten it. So they were asked around and said, like, who wrote that story? And then they, they found out through the industry that I wrote it, and then they offered me a job to the Daily News. I stayed there, I covered St. John's, and then um, after like a, a couple of years, you know, I started to get noticed from, you know, throughout the industry because I was doing like features. That was my forte, like big features. And so people noticed my writing because the Daily News before, remember, there wasn't the Internet back then. So the, all the big papers, you know, um, they, they were the ones driving the news, uh, the tabloids, you know, the New right. York Daily News. Um, in New York, you know, in competition against the Post. But the Daily News really had the biggest section um, as, as far as high school is concerned. And then, so so they noticed me um, at the Washington Post and at Seattle Times. It was crazy. I got two offers at the same time. Mm. I got an offer from the Washington Post and then I got an offer from the Seattle Times. Do you have that? Do you have that still posted? You still have that frame, that first article, um, that. Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's on my website. Oh, okay. for sure. Oh, okay. oh, for sure. Yeah, that 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 article, and to this day, that's what Stefan Marbury, you know, remembered me from to this day, mm. because the, the Washington Post offered me a, a job to cover, to work for the paper. And then the Seattle Times, within like a, a, a one week period, it was, it was crazy. I was like in journalism happened. They offered me a job to cover the Sonics. And in my profession, you got the New York Times and the Washington Post. Those still to this day are the top two papers in the country. Right. So most people who go to journalism school, they aspire to get to one of those two newspapers. Right. And I I struggle with it. I'm like, man, because the, de the, the Washington Post, the job was covering Maryland. Right. And the Seattle was covering the NBA, the Sonics. So you he, he, Cat, Gary Payton. Jesus. So I asked and and, and you, were, you were under um, Rick Sund. Uh, Rick, Rick Sun got there right was there right before I got there. Okay. He was there right before I got there, but it was a struggle. I asked around, and most people said you got to go to the Washington Post. And I'm, I, I, I some people are like just go with what you want to do, and so that's what I did. I, I went to the I went to the uh, Seattle Times, and I'll never forget the editor was like he was pissed because he don't he doesn't lose people. When you get a job at the Washington Post, you take it. Yeah. So he, when I told him I wasn't going there, he's like, what? He said, you want to on the Washington Post? He said, he said, you're going to get lost in Seattle, you know? 
And I said, I said, you know, NBA. NBA. Versus Maryland. <laughs> I said, I said, I said, Ab, he ain't know how I grew up. He yeah. knew which job I was going to take. Correct. A a any, anybody could have told him what job you <laughs> Which job I was gonna take. Most people in journalism, they were like Washington Post, man. Why don't you go to a smaller paper? You go to the, you know, the, the one of the most storied papers in, in the country. And to me, I was like, nah, man. I get to watch Gary Payton, you know, Sean and, Kemp, and, and Kemp. And actually, Kemp got traded within months of me being there. Wow. Your boys in Baker. That's when he went to Cleveland, right? Did he? Did yeah, he... exactly. Went and to Cleveland. Then the Baker, they Vin traded, came. They, yeah, they, yeah. They, traded, they traded for um, they traded for um, you know uh, the Sonics traded for Vin and let let uh, Sean Kemp go to Cleveland. And then Stefan, you know, he was in Minnesota, so he was one of the first games I covered. And he was like, "Hey, yo, yo, what's up?" Blah 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 blah. He was still talking about that 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 interview. Clip. Yeah. yeah. That is because he's a high school kid. And now I'm in Seattle and I'm yep. you know, covering the side eight. So it was cool. It was cool. Wow, that's crazy. Uh and and um little uh, a year or two later, Ray Allen came through, huh? Yes. Yeah, Ray Allen came and I, I met Ray. I actually didn't cover Ray because he he came the year that the I went to the Washington Post, but I I interviewed I I, I ran into him when he was uh, thinking about coming to Seattle. And he's a cool dude because he asked me how Seattle was and you know to live in. And I I, I basically you know gave him my thoughts. And um, after about four years, the same editor who was pissed. I didn't who, who you who you turned down yes. called you again. Right. He emailed me. I was in shock. I, I hadn't talked to him or communicated with him for four plus years. The, we left not on a bad, not on a good note. He was not happy. And um, and I got an email one day, and I actually was looking to come back because I, I, you know, I did my time. I loved it, but I was ready to come come back east. You didn't. You didn't want to. You didn't want to um, do another NBA team out east or the Knicks or. Um, Jersey or yeah, well, well, I would. I here, the, the, my thoughts were that I've been in Seattle like five years. Um, you know, I was ready to cover another team or cover the NBA. You know, I had an opportunity in, in, to cover the Warriors, but they stumped back then. Yeah, they yeah. Really Wait, really? Wait up. Yeah. You talking yeah. about with Tim Hart? With who was on that team? Uh, Mitch, Mitch Richmond. Um, I forget. Chris Mullen? Nah, they didn't. I don't, no, I, I would have to look up, but they were bad for a long time. When I was covering them, anytime we went there, it was an easy win for the Sonics. I don't think, I think. Yeah, but the Sonics was the top team, was right, the top when, team in the West. When did Mullen play for them? I, I forget off the top of my head. So you got it. I think you was, that's your St. John's boy. You should. Oh yeah, no, they were good. That that three that threesome was good, but I think it was after. Okay. After I left uh, the Sonics, but so hmm. you know the the editor of the Washington Post emailed me, and he said, "We have an opening. Are you interested?" And I was like, "Whoa," you know, and I was like, "Yeah," I, I, I like, "What is it?" And then he emailed me back. He said that, you know, it's the Washington Redskins. And I'm like, I'm not, I, I, I was fine. I cover basketball. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I'm like, I, I was, I, I followed football casually. Right. But he, um, he, he, when he, when we spoke, he said, no, no, listen to me. It's great that you cover the NBA, but... <laughs> It's a good league, very popular, but football is king. He said, if you cover the Redskins, he said, this is the second most important beat in the Washington Post. The first, the, the, guess which the most important beat was in the Washington Post? He said what? 
He said the he said covering the Redskins is the second most important beat at the Washington Post. The second most. Right. So I'm asking you what what would Politi you politics. There you go. Okay, of course. Exactly. Great guess. He said the White House beat is the number one. Oh beat. yeah. <laughs> of course. The second most Washington. Beat. Yeah. Right. But I was surprised that the second most important beat was the Washington Redskins because I you know, I wasn't from the area. I didn't realize they had a rabid fan base. And um, so he was like, you cover this team, everything will open up for you. And so I took the job. I was like, okay, I'm just letting you know. I don't know a whole, a whole lot of football. So, but he was like, nah, you, you'll learn, man. You can write, you're, you're a good journalist, so you'll, you'll learn. And he hired me and, uh, you know, I, that's what I covered, uh, you know, the rescue for a few years. And he's he was a well-known editor because he he hired like a lot of famous. He had a nice of talent. He hired Michael Wilbon. Wow. Oh, so Hill. you you was over there with Mike Mike Wilbon? Oh, yeah. oh, oh wow. Yeah, yeah. Wilbon was big time. He wasn't an ESPN yet, but he still was the biggest one of the biggest sports writers in the country. Okay. You know, he had a great voice. Uh, column voice, smart dude, um, and then um, Rachel Nichols was there. He Damn. hired Rachel Nichols. He hired Dave Aldridge. It, he had a murderer's row of staff writers. He was he's fa famous in the profession for his eyes for talent. This is, what's his name again? His name is George Salomon. He's retired. Okay. Wow. He, he, I didn't realize until I did the. It's just funny how. The six degrees of separation. I didn't know he was good friends with David Stern. So fast forward the years later, Stern did his homework on me a little bit through him. Wow. They were tight. But wow. yeah, so, so he hired, you know, he hired Dave Aldridge, Rachel Nichols, Michael Wilbon, uh Rick you, Buker, have you ever heard of Rick? Yeah, Buker? of course. Yeah. What what about um Stuart? Did you did you ever meet up with Stuart um, Scott? Oh, that's his name, Stuart Scott. He passed yeah, away. Stuart Scott of the of ESPN. Yeah. Yeah. The only time I met him, um, and he was a cool dude, was playing ball with him. Actually, they they had yeah, they had um, I forgot what it was. I'm not sure what it was. The every year the NAB game would have a convention, and I think I went to one of them. I think he was there. Stephen A was there going nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen A. Oh boy. Yo, didn't he average like two points a game or something in college or something? Oh my god. He yeah. Uh, he was going nuts. He was going nut. Oh okay. Wow. What what about um Stu could play though? Stu could play. Stu could play. I thought he could. What about Mike Smith? Michael Smith, yeah, I know Michael Smith. He, he, yeah, he wasn't there. I've never seen him on the court. It was just a pickup, you know. It was a pickup game for, for, for journalists. Okay. So I was in there, you know. It was, it was cool. And, and yeah, how did so, you do? How did you represent the on, block? You, you know, I. Mark Jackson. I, I can't jump out the gym, but I will put a few guys in the twilight zone. <laughs> Your weaknesses. weaknesses, absolutely. <laughs> any any name you want to any name you want to mention on here? Who got crossed up? Cause this could go viral. This may go viral. <laughs> any name that got crossed up, I, I I will put that as a tag. Oh, when Nuno crossed up Stephen A, did you cross up? <laughs> Nah, nah. Who did you get? Anybody we want to name? Nah, I don't even remember. Oh, okay, okay. You will remember Steven though if you cross the mark. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, he was talking a lot, man. I yeah. know my team won. I remember that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, but but how how was that transition from basketball to football? Oh, it was a no. <laughs> it could have had to be some type of bump in the road, bro. There had to be some what? Type of bump in the road. There's no way that it, it was a yeah, smooth it, transition. It, no, that 
That's a great question. It was a rocky. Oh, okay. Like I was about to say. No, because I was all in on the NBA. I didn't. I, 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 I knew football like a lay person. Right. I, I wasn't, you know, okay. into it like, uh, you know, like most most folks uh, who are sports journalists. And so I had to learn, and it was a two person beat. So um, it was it was rocky. I'm in a job where you have to really be thinking about and learning about football 24 seven. Right. And even before I learned about football, it was a seven day a week job. You know, so I just, I mean, it was almost, not 24-7, but I was earning my money. I was getting a good salary, living in a nice luxury condo. Right. I really wasn't, in, you know, I wasn't really, I was just grinding. Right. And then it took me a while to kind of like learn the sport, you know. And uh, then, you know, that's when it got interesting because I would just start writing stories that would upset Dan Snyder. Oh, because, oh yeah. The owner? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I was an outsider, and before I got there, he had a pretty chummy relationship with the paper. Okay. You know, he would pretty much feed the paper articles. Whatever he wanted. Favorable, yeah. To him, yeah. of so course. A, you know, it was a mutually beneficial uh, relationship. But nobody gave me the memo, you know. So I was just covering, covering the news. It's, they, they were a bad team, so I would write it down the middle. And you know, when you're a bad team, the news is not going to be positive. So um, that's so in I, any sport. So right, exactly. Yeah. So so, so basically, uh, he 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 was, and he couldn't control me, you know, because. You didn't work for him. <laughs> right. That was my, exactly, my mindset. He doesn't write my checks. So I got stories from the players, from agents, and then even assistant coaches. Once they saw that I would write whatever, whatever the truth, right. Man, and if I, if I was teaching or giving guidance to young journalists, that's, that's once people know they may not like what you write but once they know you're an independent reporter and no one owns you oh man they will feed you information because they know they can trust you correct you didn't get this from me but check this out you didn't get this is a real scoop so i was writing a lot of stories that were shaking things up mm -hmm. and spider got so upset that he complained to the publisher he complained to the, to the yeah, time? Yeah. To the to Washington the publisher. Wow. And this, Anthony, this story is, this, all of this is documented because it was covered a lot in this magazine called The Washingtonian. Okay. Because at that time, you know, still now, it's, one, it's, it's the biggest beat in the section and one of the biggest beats at the paper. So, so, that, Snyder yanked the Washington Post season ticket because of my coverage. <laughs> he ate you as a writer for the. Yeah, well, not my tickets. I didn't have tickets, but like people who worked at the Washington Post, oh, they he... had season tickets for decades. You know, not necessarily journalists, but people who were, did, you know, uh, machinists and, 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 you know, just people who worked at the entire company. Wow. They had season tickets. Oh, yeah, war. So, so oh. exactly. So they had 250 season tickets, and he, he yanked them from the entire newspaper to send a message. You didn't like the, me? You, you didn't keep this dude in line? I'm taking your season tickets. <laughs> <laughs> wrote a story about that. He wasn't playing. And then he, he, he tried to undermine me. I mean, I remember one agent telling me, man, dude, you were crazy, man. He was like, he's like, I don't think you understand like who you're going to war with because no one has covered the team like this. He was like, you need to be careful, man. Uh, not telling me not to write what I was writing, but he was just telling me the stakes are not a big. Like, this is a billionaire guy 
who is willing to, you know, do whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, and he was telling you know coaches not to talk to me. I remember to this day, one of the coaches told me, "Dude, you know, we just had a meeting about you." A what? Staff meeting. Yeah, Dan Snyder was there. Joe Gibbs was there. They were like, who's leaking stories to Milio DiMaggio? And what Snyder didn't understand, that gave me even more credibility with the with the staff and not the upper, you know, not the upper echelon people, you know, butt kissers, sycophants. But once they had a meeting, they said, Nuno, you were the subject of the meeting. Because Snyder tried to cut off sources, information from me, and I was still getting information. Still, not only was I getting information, I, so, so, so. Yeah, I, I, I did a story that um, Joe Gibbs had a heart procedure. Nobody knew it. Okay. Nobody knew it. And I was able to get a source that said that he just had a, a heart procedure. And that's news because he's the coach of, you know, the Redskins. Now, you can argue like, oh, it's health. You know, health privacy, but he's the head coach of the team. That's news. That's big you know? news. Exactly. So that was significant news, and I was doing. I was getting stories like that that, you know, previously, Snyder would be able to keep out the paper. So that was pissing him off, and um, he just, you know, they just, they, 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 they had this Redskins site that they would be bashing me every, you know in there like regular yeah a site for Redskins fans so they had the Nuno files <laughs> so it was like it was like a, it was like what do you call those boards like it was like um, what's that site that they have now uh, where people go in and, and they kind of like comment S Serena Williams is married to the dude who, who founded it oh uh, I forget, I forget the name of the site, but it's a site that people go, you know, it's like a board, and, you know, it's, it's before like Twitter, you know, but anyway, so they, they created the Nuno files where they would just go in there and just like, you know, this thing. So long story short, the, the Washington Post actually gave me a raise. Snyder invited the publisher to his house to complain about me. Huh. And they had a meeting. Anthony, I can't make you can't make this <laughs> Yo. up. You can't make this up. Yo. That's why like a couple of months ago some dude was doing thinking about doing a documentary on Snyder. He he I think I put it in the chat. He contacted me because he wanted to like interview me about covering Snyder. So Snyder invited the publisher of the Washington Post to his mansion to talk about my coverage. It was like the Twilight Zone, man. Yeah. Like the Twilight Zone. Was, you know, was he the cause of you leaving? No. Oh, he okay. He was the cause of me getting a raise. <laughs> you got a raise. Wow. And, and to this day, I got to thank Dan Snyder. <laughs> if, 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 if he was dealing with like a small podunk newspaper, you know, right? I, I, you know, they probably would have moved me off the beat. But this is the Washington Post. This is the newspaper that brought down Nixon. He was complaining That's, to the wrong wow. newspaper. Right. So they gave me a raise quietly. I mean, they, 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 they were like, they, they liked my coverage, you know. Um, and then they, they didn't want to lose me, but my coverage got caught the eye of the Sports Illustrated. Right. That's why I left. Okay. Because they said they saw what I was covering and, you know, I was doing features, breaking news. They heard I was going head to head with Snyder. Right. So it gave the name, you know, in the industry. Right. And uh, the Washington Post saw that and they offered me a job unsolicited. They said, you can live wherever you want, you know. And I was like, I'm coming back to New York, man. Coming back to New York. <laughs> Yeah, so it was wild. And that was when I also covered Sean, Sean Taylor. Oh, know? Sean Taylor, yeah. Yeah, safety. Yeah. Sean Taylor, unfortunately, tragically died. Right. 
uh, when he was shot, you know, in his own house. But those were a lot of stories that I did that caught the attention of, you know, uh, That's Sports right. Illustrated. Yeah. 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 So then, you know, then, then I went to Sports Illustrated. And uh, that's how I ended up meeting uh, Bill Parcells. Wow. And then, and then Parcells, I mean, then you went on a, um, a hiatus. Let's talk yeah, about that. With, with, yeah, with, with the Parcells thing, it was wild because, you know, at the time, I was at the Sports Illustrated. We, 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 there were four NFL writers. And we were in a meeting talking about story ideas. And I was like, I want to do an idea of the, the, the two tight end trends. The NFL, more teams were using two tight ends in the formation. Right. So the best example was, at that time, was the Dallas Cowboys. They had Anthony Fasano at tight end and Jason Moore. So my editor was like, yeah, go to, go to Dallas. And, 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 and do the story, interview the tight ends. And then one of the, the, the top writers, a couple of the writers, they were like, don't even bother with, you know, Bill Parcells, man. He's an asshole. You know, <laughs> he doesn't really talk to reporters one on one, you know. And then one of the, the other, one of the reporters, Peter King, had a good relationship with Bill Parcells. He's like, well, you know, if you really, really want to talk to him, maybe I'll. You know, I can go, you know, talk to his PR guy for you. But anyway, I still put in a request because to me, it's like, you know, as a professional, you still have to ask. Correct. Then, All they could do is say no. Right? Exactly. <laughs> so to my surprise and to the PR guy's surprise, he said, yeah. They were like, he's going to do his main interview, main press conference, where he's like bullying the journalist, you know. As um, usual. And, and, <laughs> exactly. And then they said, afterwards, I'll take you to his room and I'll give you five minutes. Wow. Yeah. So that's what happened. After the main interview was over, the, the, the PR guy wished me into Parcells' office. And I'm here sitting in front of Bill Parcells, and I'm like, he started asking me. So he starts asking me, he's like, I hear you're from New York, kid. Where do you live in New York? And I said, oh, I live near Lincoln Center. He said, oh, man, Sports Illustrated must be paying you well. <laughs> Lincoln Center, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty penny over there. Right. And I said, yeah. And then, so he started asking me about my background. He's like, so I heard you're, you're in New York, uh huh? Tell me about that. Where'd you go to school? And, uh, you know, what was the daily news like? So he starts asking me like a few questions. And I started, I started, I looked at my watch because the PR guy said. Five minutes. Five minutes. Right. And Marcel was going out for three minutes. And he, Parcells was like, listen, kid, don't worry about that. You'll get what you need. Just answer my questions. You know? <laughs> so, dude, he's type A squared, man. Whoa. So he asked my, he, I answered his questions. And then he's, all right, shoot, what you got? And, and so he gave me like 50. What? And, and yeah, he gave me like 50 minutes. And so I wrote the story. It was mostly on the tight end. So I, I didn't know his email address. But I like guessed it based on the PR guy's email address. I put B Parcells at Cowboys.com. Right. Just to like, email him to thank him. And to my surprise, he emailed me back. He said, he said, okay, I'll, he said, it was a pleasure meeting you. I'll look out for your story. And that's it. And then a year later, he re announces his retirement. Wow. That was huge news. That wasn't just in the sports section. That was like CNN. Yeah, that's true. You know, he was ending his legendary career. It was all over the news. Right. I emailed him again to say, hey, you know, thanks again for the interview. And good luck in your, you know, post NFL life. Right. That's it. Right. I sent that email when the news exploded. To my shock, 
Anthony, that same night, I got an email back from Bill Parcells. He said, he said, okay, kid, it was nice meeting you. Here's my cell number. If you ever need anything, call me. Wow. That was <laughs> I Anthony. Know you. <laughs> that was huge. What? That, listen, this is a guy who is guarded, famously guarded with the media. Of course. Famously, infamously guarded with the media. My jaw dropped when I saw his sound up. And I was like, whoa. He's like, I, you know, here's my cell number. You know, I'm going to be moving up to Saratoga. If you need something, you know, you can call me. Wow. My mind, I started thinking like Anthony Brown. <laughs> like at least, at least, at least you say it. Say it for the camera, baby. Say it for the camera. The hustle, the hustle started. The, the, started the hustle and the, the ambition. Right. So like, Let me do an Anthony Brown move right now with this number. MF right. Sit on this. Yes. So the next thing I do, F, is I ask him. I, 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 I email him. And I told him, you know, that, hey, I would like to uh, do a book on you. At this point, he already had a couple of books, though, right? Yeah. Good okay. Point. He had like three books. Dang. Okay. Yeah, he had three books, at least three. So I called him, and and I no, I actually called him, and I said, "Hey, Bill, how you doing? You know, I would like to do a book on you." And then he just started laughing. <laughs> he started laughing. Start and laughing. He said, he said, he said a book on me. He said, I read, like you say, he said, I've already done a few books. Oh. He, he said, Nino, listen, I'm old news, man. He said, you got to, you're, you're in Sports Illustrated, you used to work at the Washington Post, so you obviously got the goods. He's like, you need to find you a, 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 a young, up and coming coach and do a book on him. Somebody like Eric Mangini. That was when Eric Mangini was coaching the Right, so right, right, right. That's right. And my response to Bill was, Yeah. Bill, <laughs> you I'm Hall of Fame. Hot new coach. Huh? Right. <laughs> He's Hall of Fame. <laughs> what you mean? <laughs> I said, I'm looking to... Uh, he like, I've been a big writer. I said, I've been a big writer for years. I want to do a book on a coach who's lived a full life. Correct. And I, I, I want to do your book. You've lived a full life. I'm not interested in these coaches that haven't done anything and try to make it, mm -hmm. you know? And I said to him, you know, it's going to be a book like never before. None of that. Your other books have done your entire life. Right, right. And what was interesting, Ed, was even though he laughed and he's like, oh, I don't know about that, man. And... and you know, it was audacious for me to ask him because I had never written a book before. Right, right. So usually guys like that, and Bill wrote, who I nicknamed the institution, he's a he's a black columnist uh, thing. He he told me after it was all said and done, he's like, I don't think you realize you, you had made history. Because he, he said bluntly, he said a lot of us don't get to do something like that. And I, I never thought of it like that. But he's been around for like, you know, forever. So he was giving me the whole historical perspective. Correct, right. You know? right. But when I was trying to do the book, it wasn't easy. He didn't say yes, and he didn't say no. He just was like trying to encourage me to do all this stuff. And then Michael Lewis, he's an author. He's a famous author. He's done the book on uh, Moneyball. Oh, you know, Moneyball. The and, and the... Uh, he also did the book on the, uh, I think, Michael Orr, the, the left tackle. Okay. Uh, I forget the name of that movie, but he's done a lot of bestsellers. And uh, I went to him for advice because he had done a New York Times Magazine profile on Parcells. And he flat out told me, he said, hey, I don't, I don't mean to discourage you, but... I don't see a, I don't see any 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 journalist or writer getting a full book out of Parcells. He's like, if I if I 
thought a full book could have been done, I would have done the book on Parcells. So I said, okay. It was a little cocky, but I mean, this guy was a multiple best-selling author. But I did. I, I still was like, I want to do the book. Let him tell me no. Yeah, of course. So, one to so one. Him, yeah, I was sending him articles, and you know, he was reading my articles. I was trying to prove myself to him. And finally, I sent him a uh, like a story about my mom and my mom like raising us. You know, just I was like, hey, I just want you to know, you know, where about, you coming from, right? Yeah, about my life through her eyes. You know, raising five kids in you know in, in, in West Harlem, three boys. You know, putting us all through college, right? And that stuff. So he read it. He's like, man. He's like, you should be doing a, a, a book on your mom. She's, she's, you know, what an amazing story. And then he invited me to Saratoga. He invited you up top? He wow. He invited me to Saratoga. Okay. He said, listen, kid. He loved calling me kid. He said, listen, kid. Come to Saratoga and I'll give you my answer. So I come to Saratoga. My jacket, you know, we go to his favorite little... You know, restaurant kind of cafe type thing. It's nothing fancy. You know, people are, you know, staring at us and uh, and um, staring at not us but him. And right. The, the waitress comes over toward the end of our, and I, I I I have some sticky notes and I'm telling him, you know, the book idea. I'm trying to sell him on the book idea, and I tell him, you know. If you're not, if you're not gonna let me interview everybody, you shouldn't do this book. Later right. on, one of my journalism friends told me I was crazy to say that, but I—that's just how I felt. I'm like, just let's do this book if it's gonna be serious and nuanced. Right. And then I said I'm gonna interview over a hundred people. I'm going to, uh, you know, finance it myself. I'm gonna borrow money from people. Right. I said, um, you know, it's going to take me four or five years. So the waitress came over and said, Bill, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. You know, this, this, this woman over there wants, would love to take a picture, ask if you could take a picture with her. And then Bill was like, sure, just, just give us like 10 minutes. I'm talking to somebody crazy over here. <laughs> And he was like, yeah, this guy's crazy over here. He's talking about doing a, 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 a book on a five-year project and not working nine to five while he does a book. He's never done a book before. Crazy man over here. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, at the end of the day, after it was all said and done, right. he goes back to the train station. And I, I remember this just like it was yesterday because I was so excited. He said... Uh, he shook my hand. He said, "Listen, kid, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this with you. I'm gonna do this with you." Um, and then he had a few weird requests. He said, "I don't want, you know, as long as you don't hurt my wife and kids. You can ask, talk to them, talk to anybody. I don't want this book to hurt them." And then he's like, and um, and then he just shook my hand. He said, "Don't f this up." Those were his last words to me. He said, don't F this up, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and, and then I just went to work, man. Wow. It was it was hard, man, because there were times when he would not talk to me. after I, Because what I was doing is I was sending him chapters, sending him material. Every right. Once. And so sometimes he would get a material and he would be so angry, he wouldn't return my calls. I mean, there were times I thought I lost the book because he he would he he would just be upset over interviews of of other no, people. Just, just, yeah, exactly. What he was reading, what they were saying, right? Right. But see, he he didn't understand, and I had to I had to explain it to him. I'm like, we're doing a narrative from beginning to end. So what you're reading right at this moment. He's going to address it, but I'm like, it's going to, we got to do it in chronological order, you know? So he, he, he got it by the end of the project, but it was extremely difficult. And um, 
I just kept writing. Even when he didn't return my calls, I just kept writing. And I remember, I, I won't forget it. There was this chapter I did on when he had heart surgery. I interviewed his, I went to his, to Philadelphia to interview his heart surgery. Wow. And it had a lot of like details. And he gave you information? Wow. Yeah, it was, it was, it was great information. Great information from the surgeon, from his wife. The wife was saying Parcel was scared he was going to die. So it was like intimate stuff. No one knew. There was stuff in there he didn't know. So he, he, he read that chapter and he called me back after not talking to me for like two months. Right. He, he's like, you ought to be commended for that chapter, man. He said, you ought to be commended for that chapter. That was a really great chapter. He's like, I see you're working hard on this. Okay, let's see where this goes. So, you know, that that's pretty much, you know, the highlights of the book. You know, but wow. he was a he was a he was his, he was more difficult than you would imagine, man. Uh, I can tell. <laughs> For real. For um, real. Not not those But kids. but 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 you know when when people when you're getting when you're hearing stuff about you from other people it can be difficult sometimes because you get their point of view. They right. is not you. You know what I'm saying? Right. So right. I can see how that can be. Yeah. You know, problematic at some point. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. 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 That's, a, that's a good word. Problematic. Yeah. Problematic. He like, where is this? And being being how how he is too. He's a alpha for real, for real. I I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. I mean, he had shoot. Lawrence Taylor, he ran him around, so if he can right. run LT yeah. around, so exactly. somebody saying something crazy about him, probably not exactly. going to, yeah, not going to exactly. go with too well. Yeah. And he still had a lot of power in the league. I mean, there were, I remember one time. Is he, wasn't he an owner at the time of Miami? Oh, he was, he was retired, but then he became president of the Dolphins. Right. Before he became president of the Dolphins, F, it was just, it was like being in a, I mean, like being behind the scenes, it's like this dude is one of the most powerful people in the NFL at the time. Right. He was getting calls from Sean Payton, Bill Belichick, um, Tom Coughlin. But he brought he brought he brought Bill in, right? Didn't he bring right. Bill? Yeah. Yeah. He, he, yeah. So so owners were contacting him who were trying to get head coaches who were trying to get his approval. He. There was no one in the NFL with his cachet or his level of respect. Everybody was calling him to get his approval. Owners, general managers, you know. And it was I was just like sitting in the car writing with him and just listening, being an ear on the, you know, a, a, a fly on the wall. It was cool. It was cool. Wow. Yeah, man. So we gonna wrap this up, or? yeah, yeah, man. This this is good, man. Um, I, I I appreciate it, and um, you know, I'm just gonna add, I'm just gonna add that, you know, your book was a bestseller. <laughs> well, uh, what's well, what's your what's your um? Do you have any other projects? Any um? Any books that you thinking about writing? I remember you tried to get your your king LeBron, but uh, that yeah, that probably. I, if I'm you. He, he did a book with the Buzz Bizzard. Oh, oh, did he? Okay. Yeah, he did a book. I didn't think that was the the the, the right author for the book. Bizzard, Buzz Bizzard has a big name, and you know he's right. a famous writer, Friday Night Lives. But I don't think he was the right author for that book. Right. Uh, but he, he he did a book with Buzz Bizzard. So you so you think you could have you could have done better. That's what you say. I think that I would have done a better book. Okay. I know it sounds. Yeah, get, let me let me uh, but, anything but, that's gonna make me trend, let's do. It. <laughs> you know what? I think I think I need to take that part out. <laughs> nah. Hey man, hey real, you talk. We talking real right here, bro. Let Shit. Me, well, let, let me tell you about some book projects instead of that. I mean, because that sounds ridiculous to say. You. You would do, you would have done a better book than one of the top writers. You, you, you believe? Yeah, he's. Yeah. But I, I will say this: like the thing that I'm proud about about the Parcells book is that you know 
he didn't do any promotion, promoting. And he said it from the start, and I used to meet with him, kind of make fun of him, but he kept his word. He said, hey, I, I'm not, you know, I just don't want to do it, you know? Uh, that was his personality. But the book still did well, even though Parcel did not, you know, actively promote it. So I'm proud of that, you know, Sports Illustrated excerpted it, that helped. But, you know, word of mouth, but it got a lot of write-ups in newspapers. And so uh, I, I was definitely uh, proud of how it uh, turned out to, for a book that, you know, did get heavy promotion. Wow. Uh, and so, yeah, I, and then I, I, I asked uh, David Stern to do his next book. A lot of folks don't prior, to his, prior to his passing, yeah. Yeah, prior to his passing. That's how I ended up doing a podcast with him because um, he, um, I, 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 I sent him the parcels books and I told him I would like to, like him to be my next project. And that was another wild story because I didn't know David Stern from Adam. And right. even though I was an NBA beat writer, I mean, there's a ton of NBA beat writers, David Stern. Right. You know, guys like, you know, Aldridge, you know, Stephen A or, you know, the big names in, among NBA writers, but he called me back. I was in shock. I mean, literally, I missed the call and I hear on the voice, but hey, you know, you know, this is David Stern, you know, uh, call my office when you get a chance. And the, the interesting thing is him and Paul Sells are like similar, another alpha dude. Yeah. So <laughs> he invited me to his, he invited me to his um, office. And I was shocked and, and excited. So I went there and within five minutes, Anthony, he said, I'm just letting you know I'm not doing a book with you. <laughs> Shot. <laughs> you know what I was saying in my head? I was saying in my head, what the F am I doing here? Then? Like, what, what, why'd you invite me? Because I got, ex I got excited because he's inviting me to his office. Right. And so I'm like, I, I think I have a chance. And so he answered the question for me. And without me even, but in my head, I was like, so why am I here? Right. And he said, you know what? He said, I just wanted to meet you. He said, you, you, you're an interesting guy. Black guy whose last name is Damasio. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, you did a book on Parcells. He's like, that must have been hard. <laughs> you know, he's like, he's like, he's like we, I, we've watched Parcells and see how he commands his media presence and just be like, wow, you know. Um, he's a, just masterful of, you know, uh, really... Um, parrying with the media right. so he he said that yeah he's like you know I just wanted to meet you that's all he's like he, yeah, he's like plus I promised the owners I'm never going to do a book you know oh wow he, yeah he promised the owners he was never going to do a book and the owners were happy um, to hear that because you know he, he, he knows where all the skeletons are oh yes he that's does the story he could tell yep. you know um, and so he said to them that he would never do a book and he like Nuno, and they're bigger, you know, they're big writers who's asked me to do a book. If I do a book with you, and I'll piss all of them off, you know? <laughs> so, but, but what was weird was that every couple of months, I would get a call from his assistant, and his assistant would say, David Stern wants to see you. Wow. That's what I said. I said, wow, because F, he wasn't retired. This dude was still, I mean, he was still working 12 hours a day. He was doing um, deals, you know, some deals with Magic, some deals with Kevin Durant, because when he did a deal, he got part ownership for something, they wanted it. Right, you know? right, and, right, right. He was, he was still, you know, Still in making, life. still wheeling and dealing. Still wow. wheeling and dealing. That's the best way to describe it. Still wheeling and dealing. And he had a full schedule. So the his assistant... Where's David Stern from? Harlem? 
Yeah. He must be from Harlem. <laughs> he got to be from Harlem with that. Gee, you know, you know how we hustle. Sheesh. Okay. He got to be from Manhattan with that. Even when he was talking to me, he was telling me how I should monetize a podcast. He was always thinking money, man. You're right. Always thinking money. Yeah, he's a hustler. Oh, he's a hustler. Oh, so man. So basically, his assistant told me, you know, Bill really likes you. I would just go with the flow. Because we were trying to figure out, like, why is he having me in every couple of months? No exaggeration. I wasn't calling in. He was calling me. Wow. Because I was trying to work out my next project. Right. And so what was fascinating is, like, he would let me do, take notes. Like I was doing a book. Like, tell me stuff off the record and on the record. For the hour, we listen. We would, yeah, we would talk for an hour. And on the record, he let on you. On the record, right? And some of it was off. He was like, "You can't repeat that," you know. So it was, you know, some people theorized it. It was just a matter of time before he was like, "Okay," you know. Um, a couple people who knew him well said he was probably just getting comfortable with. Because okay. they like they they said Stern is not gonna meet with somebody for an hour unless he has something in mind. Correct. Um, he was and, thinking of something big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. R. I. P. Yeah, yeah, but that's crazy. He, he, that's what that's that's what it sounded like. And and you know, I got lucky with the Parcells book and rest in peace to David Stern, you know. I got unlucky, not unlucky, you know. Because he's not a, she's not around. But you know, the fret, the, the the relationship was just starting. Right. You know, the relationship was just starting, and when he told me he was not going to do the book, he asked me what I was doing. I said, "Okay, well, I'm starting a podcast," and uh, he was like, "Okay, just so you don't think I'm an asshole, I'll be your first guest." <laughs> That's dope. So, Anthony, I was so happy, man. Yeah. You know, because he wasn't doing interviews. Did it? Did it go viral? Did it go viral? Oh, the it went. It went crazy. Oh, okay. Viral. Okay. This is. This is. Yeah. This is pre. Yeah, wow. And, and and Anthony, he did something that to this day his assistant, uh, great woman Linda Tassi, she's a bit been his assistant for like 25 was his assistant for 25 years she didn't think he would come over to my house I just asked him and he said yeah to her surprise matter of fact Adam Silver Adam Silver after it was done he sent me an email saying he couldn't believe that I got David Stern to come to, to my apartment wow it's no joke and then after it went viral, the reason it went viral was because for the first time ever, he responded to Brian Gumbel calling him a um, plantation owner. He wow. Had, he had never. I don't even remember that. Oh, yeah. It made big news. He called. It, this was during negotiations for the CBA. Oh, okay. And it was a very inflammatory. What, what, what year was that? What year was that? It was in the early 2000s, and oh. it was a very inflammatory thing to say. Wow. So, but Stern never defended himself. Everyone else defended him. Like, Magic defended him. Isaiah defended right. him. Right. Some of Stern's, you know, executives defended him. He never spoke on how he felt. So he spoke, and he was candid, and he called Brian Gumbold an idiot. And right. And he said, I've done more for black people than Brian Gumbold. And that's a deep, like... And I was like, whoa. I said, Dave, you know that's gonna that's gonna cause controversy. Right. You sure you wanna say that? After he ain't care, man. He, he put it care. out. <laughs> he, he didn't care. He didn't care. And then also he said for the first time he addressed overruling the trade of sending Chris Paul to the Lakers. To the Lakers. He had never spoken on that. Right. And then he criticized Hillary Clinton. That made it to USA Today. He criticized her saying, her slogan, you know, uh, I'm with her. Because he was like, that was a weak slogan. 
Oh. <laughs> he gave like three or four different slogans because he was he was a brilliant strategist. Correct. And so I mean, think about all the NBA slogans. You right. Know, I love this game. Blah yep. blah blah. blah. So it was it was just a great podcast and it was Now he's a marketing he was a marketing genius. A marketing genius, exactly. So it went, you know, the Washington Post covered it, USA Today, uh, the Bleacher Report, it was covered overseas. Anthony it, it was it was downloaded in over sixty countries. That was the first time I realized how global the NBA was. I knew it was global. But literally 60 countries covered the podcast. 60 countries. He emailed me uh, after, like a few, a few days later, and he said, Nuno, you caused the shit storm. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. No joke. He said, you, you have caused the shit storm. So it, 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 it was, you know, it was... It, it, it was, you know, I, I just felt blessed at him knowing it the little that I did because it was so hard to get close to him like that, you know. Uh, mm. And it was, it was cool. Oh, it was cool. cool. Yeah, man. So yeah, so that's it. Right now, I do. I, I, I there is one project that I'm, I'm thinking about doing, but I'll tell you about it another time. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about that another time. Exactly. And and. and, and Thank you for um, coming on the podcast, my little you podcast. Got it, man. And I um, mean, just just seeing the artwork in the background <laughs> and, and, and the Sure Mike, the thousand dollars. Sure yeah, Mike, come on, man, this dude you know, right here, the man. The BMW of Mike's. I'm like, this guy came for this real. That is something he, else, boy. He came. He came for real. He came prepared. Now you 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 threw me for a loop because I didn't know what you were going to do. I didn't even know this was your idea, so you sprung it on me. Most people who, if they're going to interview somebody for a podcast, they tell them you know like a week in advance. Anthony just be like, call him. Can I let, let me call you in, in an hour? Fuck and it. then he shows up. That's with his that's that's what foot. you do. That's that's what we do when we're from the block. Man, so. I hear you. All right. I hear you. All, All right, right All right, man. Yo, one. You know I'ma talk to you anyway, so Exactly <laughs> So yo, good looking out. Good looking out. I know you sorry. You just needed somebody you could relate to. Don't know karate. You break my heart, yours gotta break too. You know my body. You know the vibes, I don't wanna chase you. I'm in your lobby. I pull up looking like you wish came true. These ain't our money. Girl, these is pride and trust ain't new. They tryna lie me. Cause I do things that they just can't do. And they don't want no problem, so tell them to play cool, yeah. Tell me the track featured on today's show is titled Karate by Harlem Zone St. Peter. Available on all streaming platforms. Discover extraordinary stories from your own neighborhood and beyond by visiting myblockpodcast.com. Subscribe now to be a part of the journey where we share captivating tales of remarkable individuals residing on your street, your block, or your section. Calling all musicians. If you're eager to have your music featured on our show, head over to newkingmmg.com for submission details. Join us in celebrating local talents and spreading their melodies to a wider audience.